back to NH Unscripted. We are not yet on the cover of the Rolling Stone, but one day we'll get there. I am your Dr. Hook-like host, Ray Dudley. So happy to be out of bed. It's always a good day when I put one foot on the floor and I realize I'm still here. Ah, we are coming to you from the YMCA-like digs of the WKXL Studios in Concord. I can smell the chlorine from here, baby. 14.50 a.m., 103.9 FM in Concord. That's on your Sony Walkmans. Put on those junky headsets they give you so you can hear us more clearly. 101.9 FM in Manchester for all the beautiful people down there. NHTalkRadio.com is our URL because that's where the cool kids hang out. Everybody's out there. I'll give you a little bit more information about the URL in a little while. Ooh, I need to thank my sponsor. Lakes Region Fence up there in Guilford. Oh, my gosh, Matt. And those guys do incredible work. Incredible work. LRFence.com is their URL. And you can go out there. There's a button. You can get a free estimate. We do like free. That's why we like to go to Costco. Get all those little free little samples as we walk around the store. Free is good. Click the button. Matt will give you a free estimate for a new fence. Look, if you're thinking about a pickleball court, you get your pool fence needs repair, your property line fence needs repair. If it needs a fence... Give them a ring. Give them a jingle. Give them a click the button. Free estimates. LRFence.com. If you go onto their website, there are reams and reams and reams of photos of the incredible work those guys do. And they don't buy their stuff from the big box stores. Uh Uh-uh. Not at all. They actually buy quality, believe it or not. Hmm. Just saying. LRFence.com. Thank you, Matt. We appreciate all that you do for us and your support of this almost award-winning show. Should be an award-winning show. Maybe someday it will be an award-winning show. Anyway, in that vein of award-winning things, we have got a barn burner for you today. We're talking magic. Yes, that means Andrew Pernard is in the house. Good morning, sir. Good morning. I'm glad you uh, mentioned award-winning because I actually am here to present the award for my favorite podcast and what? radio show of all time what? to you, Mr. Ray Dudley. Well, so thank, thank you, thank you sir. And congratulations. Woo, I can hear the crowd from here. I the wish I had one of those buttons. <laughs> certificate is in the mail. Oh, yeah, yeah, along with the check. I'll take them both. Thank you. It's good to see you. Nice to see you, too. I haven't seen you for a while. Yeah, I've been, uh, been busy. Yeah? So. What are you doing? Doing. Well, I'm doing my main gig that I've been doing for 34 years, which is performing. Um, you know, I've been traveling, performing magic. I was recently in Chicago. I visited the Chicago Magic Lounge and uh, have done a number of private performances and public performances as well lately. Uh, I'm still doing my monthly show, Discovering Magic, with a sleight of hand show uh, at a variety of places. And uh, I'm kind of excited. But family life and uh, work and whatnot has taken a lot, too. My daughter just graduated with her. Congrats. master's degree what? master's of science in oceanography what? she's actually as we speak on a ship in the pacific doing uh research there this is her third summer of spending more than a month on the ocean uh on a on a vessel doing marine science that is incredible yeah i'm pretty proud of her i'll bet you are my gosh I don't think I ever even knew she was in college. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, that's what happens. They're born, and then one day they are yeah. out there, and either they disappoint you or they don't. Mine has yeah. not disappointed Once in a while, they come back. Yeah, no. Uh, you know, there's been <laughs> lots of changes in my life uh, since last I was on. Um, we had, uh, of course, Hatbox Theater. I had to close its physical venue at the Steeplegate Mall. Um, that uh, they uh, Originally, we were supposed to leave there in June of this year, in other words, this month, but yeah. they wanted to accelerate the schedule, and so they boot us in January, but they have done nothing. Nothing. Yet. So, they but have done nothing. But we have lots of people who are still performing uh, shows uh, that were f- associated with our season nine, and we've got some stuff coming up. But we can talk more about that later. Um, but no, in my personal life, you know, we were uh, my mother in law passed away, which oh. you know she was ninety five going on ninety six, so she led a very full life, and we're grateful to have been able to spend so much time with her. But I'm kind of at that uh, you know crossroads of life, that transition. Uh, there was a book by a 
woman by the name of Gail Sheehy called Passages, which kind of talked about life and, you know, the different passages we make as we go from being, you know, a child and then uh, a teenager and then uh, an adult, young adult, and then an older adult, and then an older an adult, and then an older adult. It just rolls I'm down I'm in one hill. of those phases. I know that. Yeah. I well, know I, that. I know that you're probably at the same stage I am where all of myself and my friends of a certain age get together. And the first thing we talk about is, uh, well, how are you feeling? What's wrong with you today? What medicines are you on? I fight that question so much. <laughs> I fight it. I fight it. So that's why I spend all my days really, uh, you know, kind of playing. Um, I've, I've had the opportunity to kind of expand my reach and uh, work with a couple of different places. The town hall in Bradford, uh, where I live, um, a, a couple of years ago, I was the chair of the select board. And... Uh, pushed forward a proposal to renovate the town hall, which is a project that has been going on well over a decade. Wait, and the how money, did they not know they should renovate their town hall? Well, you know, different people have different priorities, and people are always concerned with taxation and, and you know, what uh, what things are going to cost. Uh, we came in at just the right time. We'd been working on the project since back 2006, 2007. Um, the facility was closed in 2011, and it had had a couple of different fits and spurts as They're far as Town Hall has been closed? It had been, yeah. I mean, there were legitimate reasons for it. There were mold issues. There were safety, egress, ingress issues and things of that Don't people pay taxes there? I mean, what? (laughs) People do pay taxes. In fact, they paid taxes to have to, uh, you know, have their uh, operations, municipal operations in lots of different spaces. But the good news is that just a couple of weeks ago, uh, I was able to preside over the grand reopening of the town hall, which has a stage on the second floor. And of course, I helped to consult on that project. And I put in lots of hours working behind the scenes to make sure that the uh, 125-year-old facility would be up to modern standards. I say 125 years, but the space that the theater is in was actually built, I think, in 1798. Mother of God. So it's quite a an older space. The building has gone through a lot of iterations over the years. But I'm, we're very excited. The community is excited. And again, it's great to have another place to do arts and performances. Is that their and, goal? Is that they hope to... Use it, it as a They do. A they want to use it theater. as a mixed-use space. Yeah. Um, so it has a platform stage. They used to do a lot of shows in there over the years, uh, and they're anxious to have more in there. So, yeah, we're we're excited to see what comes out of it, and I'm recruiting uh, different community organizations from that area to try to do shows there. They've wanted me to move Hatbox there. Honestly, most of the production companies who work with us are from the seacoast or the south of New Hampshire, so yeah. it's a little far for them to go. Um, and I honestly you know, don't know what's going to come up with me in the future, so I want to be able to kind of keep things a little loose. So I don't know where Bradford is. Can you give me a Sure. Bradford is uh, approximately 27 miles uh, up the uh, I Interstate 89. So if you head up towards oh. Dartmouth and you either take exit five or exit nine uh exit nine is the warner bradford exit and it's the way most people get off to go to mount sunapee so we're only 10 miles from mount sunapee so um you know i have lived there since 1995 uh we live in an old 1800s rambling farmhouse uh with attached barn and it's a it's a great space it was a great space to raise a family it's a wonderful tiny town of you know 1500 plus people um, but, you know, we're only 30 minutes from Concord by car, so yeah, it's yeah, really yeah. not that far out there. But. So you would be afraid to, and I don't, I really want to address the, the magic part of everything, but as long as you brought it up, the you think there'd be, how much of a drawer is coming from the seacoast for Hatbox? A, a big one? Well, or are you talking about groups that want to perform? I'm talking about producers. I mean, Hatbox has a very specific model that's unlike uh, pretty much anything else that's out there. Right. You know, our goal and mission has been to provide a venue um, that is well outfitted for performing arts groups. And for a long time, uh, you know, Hatbox drew people from far and wide because we were offering something that really no one else was offering. Um, in the interim, we've seen a lot of growth and we've seen other spaces, not necessarily necessarily adapt to the model, but um, smaller spaces, other spaces crop up, or venues literally coming out of the blue, like the Colonial Theater in Laconia. I mean, it didn't exist, and now it exists. Uh, The Lakeport Opera House, that didn't exist, now it exists. Uh, Over in Maine, Sanford, Maine, has the uh, Nassan Little Theater, which was a former community college campus Mm -hmm. that they took one of the buildings and turned into a a performing arts space and has a gym and things of 
that nature as well. So, you know, the opportunities, you know, there's the mill space in uh, right, New Market. Right. Uh, again, a lot of these spaces either were just being in the planning stages uh, when Hatbox opened or uh, didn't exist at all uh, and have opened since then. So I don't want to say that there's not a need. There's still a definite need. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think that the community uh, is always looking for other places to go. Another group that you've featured recently here, which is a great organization that I worked with back in the mid-80s, was the Pittsfield Players. And they've ramped up their season as well. They're doing a lot more stuff. So it's great to see And they've updated their theater as well. I haven't been in in a couple of years, but I'm glad to hear it. Man, man, you got to get out there. Okay, we're going to put a pin in that. We got sidebarred already. One block down and I'm sidebarred. Son of a gun. Well, we're on the road to Shambhala, baby. You are listening to NH Unscripted. I am your Three Dog Night Like host. We are coming to you from the Taj Mahal-like digs of the WKXL Studios in 1450 AM, 103.9 FM. 101.9 101.9 FM for the beautiful souls in Manchester. NHTalkRadio.com is the URL. Andrew Pernard is in the house. I'm trying to get him to talk magic. I guess we'll get to it. Hang on. People now, smile on your brother. You are listening to NH Unscripted. I am your young bloods like host, Ray Dudley. So, so happy to be out of bed. I'm talking to my friend Andrew Bernard. You are listening to us either 1450 AM, 103.9 FM in Concord, or 101.9 FM in Manchester, or NHTalkRadio.com, where there is a button out there to listen to everything live. But we'll talk some more about that in a minute. Mr. Pernard. Dude, you dumped a truckload of information on me in the first 60 seconds. I want to talk to you about magic. I do the hat box. I love the hat box. We'll get back to the hat box. But you mentioned a convention in Chicago. A magic uh, this convention? wasn't a convention. I was attending the Chicago Magic Lounge, which is a uh, theater that was created solely for the purpose of presenting magic to the lay public. Um, and so it's a it's a place that celebrates Chicago's place as one of the significant stops in magic history. Uh, back in the 30s and 40s, magic was kind of the heart and soul of magic within the United States. Um, magic has long had uh, a history of kind of locales that kind of further the the industry. So, you know, it started in New York and then it went to Chicago and then from Chicago it went to Las Vegas. Uh, well, it went to Los Angeles first with the Magic Castle and then Vegas is the current kind of magic capital of the world. But in Chicago, they have created this wonderful venue called the Chicago Magic Lounge, which they feature uh, shows um, pretty much every night. And they also prefer, they present bar magic, which is uh, was basically invented in Chicago where a magician performs behind the bar to the patrons who are all drinking and talking and eating and whatnot. But they cre- it's a style of magic. It's an interactive type of uh, work that I did. Um, I published the Magic Menu with Jim Sisti back in the days, uh, and we taught people how to work in restaurants and bars and perform magic Wait, there. What? Yeah, it's a uh, it the had, Magic Menu. The Magic Menu was a magazine. I didn't found it. Uh, Jim Sisti founded it, and the first five years, Jim published it on his own. And in year six, I came on board and took over production of the magazine for him. He stayed. Uh, he was the editor and publisher, but I did the production for it, and I had a monthly column on performing magic, you know, in interactive type of settings. Speaking of magic in, of, in interactive settings, in a moment I want to do a magic trick for your audience. Okay. So I'm going to encourage, I want to prepare them for this. So if people are listening, uh, you know, however you listen to uh, this, grab a deck of cards, and out of that deck of cards I want you to pull out five red-faced cards, it doesn't matter what they are, and five black-faced cards. So you have a total of ten cards, five red-faced, five black-faced. So just set those aside, and when we get to it, we'll play okay. uh, in just a little bit. But yeah, the, I was actually attending um, a performance. A friend of mine, Peter Samuelson, travels all around the world performing and wrote a book called Theatrical Magic, which was all about magic presented theatrically in a way that engages audiences' hearts and minds and not just their 
uh, sense of wonder kind of a thing. He's an incredible magician. He's also an incredible artist, and he was presenting a residency at the Magic Lounge. They had every Wednesday night for three months, he did a 90-minute-plus uh, show for the house, and uh, I went out to see his last performance. And uh, Peter and I had been friends for years, attended conferences together, uh, history conferences, and we have both uh, share similar sensibilities in terms of presenting magic as a theat- theatrical experience. So, Do you prefer magic on a on a more intimate basis, or um, it, it seems like it might lose something in a larger venue. I think it. How do you feel? It, magic is experienced differently by different people, yeah. and different people like different types of magic. I mean, you have manipulation, which is where somebody manipulates an object in front of the audience, and if you can't see it, you can't experience it. Right. Uh, often, it it sticks to only a couple of facets of magic. There was a, a writer, Daryl Fitzky, who wrote a book called The Trick Brain, uh, a very interesting and at times controversial book that basically looked at everything you can do in magic and tried to categorize it. So you have vanishes, you have appearances, you had transformations, you had, um, you know, all of these individual components that happen, and some of them were mental magic, you know. But animation, frankly, animation in my mind is probably one of the strongest things anyone can do where you take an inanimate object and give it the appearance of life. Like a handkerchief or something? Yeah, it could have a handkerchief dance. I mean, Harry Blackstone Sr. had a handkerchief that would come to life and dance across the stage and uh, his son continued it and it's just a remarkable piece but I personally like the type of magic which is done with ordinary objects or is done in close proximity the further away you are and let's face it it's not just magic that suffers this but the further away you are the less involved in the performance you often are so that's true in magic it's also true in theater if you're sitting in the stalls way in the back of the theater and you're having a hard time seeing you're having a hard time hearing you're going to be less emotionally engaged in what's going on. So my career over the years, it's been uh, 34 years full time now, um, of performing magic has run the gamut from performing in opera houses and large theaters to performing, you know, my sleight of hand show for as few people as two. Uh, and honestly, every experience for me is a, is a strong experience, but the the more pure and visceral reactions from people when it comes to magic comes when it happens in their hands and it happens, you know, where, yeah. where they feel like they're a significant part of it. And frankly, I like to tell my audiences uh, when they see the performances that uh, magic is unlike any of the other performing arts. Um, you know, most arts, you're trying to tell a story, whether it's a painting and you're telling a story through the visual image, whether it's a dance and you're telling a story through the movement, whether it's theater where you're literally telling a story, um, you know, puppetry, things of that nature. But magic is one of those rare circumstances that, yes, they can tell a story, but magic is fundamentally about creating a story in which your audience are the heroes. So it's very rare in our life. We all mm. live our lives passing through the world, wanting, believing ourselves to be the hero in our own story, and that may be true, but how often do you get cast as a hero when you're not expecting to be, yeah. and you get to experience something that can create a story that you're a part of and you can share with people you know, for generations to come? So that's really what excites me about magic is the, um, the potential. You know? So you have a show coming up when this program airs. It'll be tonight. Um, June 12th? Uh, yes, at the Kimball 12th. Jenkins? Yeah. At Kimball Jenkins. Tell me a little bit about that. Sure. Uh, I've been performing Discovering Magic for, uh, we're in our 12th year of performances, monthly performances here in Concord. We're what? in Hampshire's longest running years? show, as far as I'm aware. Um, yeah, we've performed at a number of places. We started at Red River uh, when Hatbox opened. We moved it to Hatbox. Uh, since Hatbox closed, I've presented it a few times at the United Shoe Repair on Main Street yeah. uh, in the window, store window, which was lots of fun because people People walking by would be like, what's going on in there? And uh, that was fun. And now we're starting a new uh, limited partnership with uh, Kimball Jenkins Estate, uh, where I'm going to be performing Discovering Magic there for the next three months. Uh, so June t- uh, June 12th 
July 10th and August 14th. Those are all Wednesdays at 7.30 p.m. We'll be doing Discovering Magic in their carriage house. Uh, and it's not the first time I've performed magic in that space, really? actually. Um, I've done a couple of events over the years for the Kimball Jenkins previous administrations and things of that nature to engage the community. But we're very excited to get back there and, you know, uh, get people into the space and see what's happening. The hope is, is at some point we'll do something in the mansion house, but we're in the carriage house, which has a an art gallery set up so people no can enjoy stage, though, things. Right? Is it- no stage though, right? No stage. I mean, it, frankly, a stage is just whatever space you're standing on when you tell your story. As Peter Brooks would say, the empty space is a stage yeah. uh, waiting for the stories to come. So, But I set up a table, which becomes my stage, and I have, uh, you know, I have some expectations for people in terms of seating. Uh, but it's a very interactive show. Um, it's It grew out of my work in restaurant and bars where I was performing three to five minutes or maybe as much as 10 minutes at a table or for a group. Uh, I used to do bar shows behind the bar where I'd perform for 30 minutes or so for the people who are, uh, you know. Drunks. Visiting. <laughs> um, yeah, it's uh, when, when oh, you yeah, are visiting. enhanced, I mean. so to speak, <laughs> it can be a challenge to keep people's attention. Uh-huh. And, and that's one of the other things that really distinguishes magic. You can watch a play or you can uh, watch a television show and be on your phone and, and don't have to really pay attention. But for the most profound uh, experience, you really need to focus and pay attention. What would you say, if you could, if you can think of it, what would you say would be the most astonishing feat that has happened in, in like a bar set? You know, I, I think I told you before a long time ago, but I, I saw this magician who he, he would take a deck of cards and he threw it at this window pane of this store and one of the cards stuck on the outside of the glass yep come on or or i saw he he had a coin and he had someone put a, their initials on a coin it disappears you look up and there's on this shelf above in this restaurant sealed cans of coke he takes one down opens the can right there and the coins in there yep Proud Mary, <laughs> keep on burning. Who I am, your Ike and Tina Turner like host, Ray Dudley. You are listening to NH Unscripted. Mother of God, I'm having a ball. We are coming to you 1450 AM, 103.9 FM. That's Concord based 101.9 FM for the beautiful, beautiful, beautiful souls in Manchester. NHTalkRadio.com is the URL. We're getting around to actually doing some magic here in a second. Andrew's going to surprise me. We will be right back. Listening to NH Unscripted. I am your doctor, hook, like host, Ray Dudley. You are listening to us either on 1450 AM or 103.9 FM in Concord, perhaps 101.9 FM in Manchester, or perhaps nhtalkradio.com where you have clicked the live button. Yeah, yeah, we do it all. Andrew Pernard, my good friend, who well, we've known each other for quite a while, is in the house. And we're talking magic. And baby, we're talking magic. Not like the magic that happens between me and my squeeze. We're talking magic, magic. I'm yeah. not sure we're allowed to talk about that on the air, <laughs> but maybe you I, are. I don't far know. As far as I'll go. <laughs> so hey, we, I mentioned in our last segment that I'd like to perform some magic yes, on the air. Yes. And I encourage people at home to grab a deck of playing cards and take out five red cards and five black cards. Okay. And uh, you've got some in I front do. of you. Andrew, the engineer in the booth, has some. And if he wants to play along, it would be great. And I'm going to encourage you folks to play along. It doesn't okay. really matter right now what the value of the cards are. Okay. Uh, and in fact, I'd like you to kind of just shuffle them oh, up. So. Okay. Uh, there, the, you don't know. Well, it doesn't matter whether you know or not. But you just shuffle them up okay. so they have different distribution of reds and blacks in okay. the right. in the stuff. Once you've done the shuffling, I'm shuffling what now. I want you to do is I want you to uh, turn the pile uh, face up. Up. Okay. Yep. And then you're going to deal them out into uh, two piles, uh, reds and blacks. Okay. So they're in all. It doesn't really matter. You'll see the order is all different. Uh, and that works uh, really well. Okay. okay. And then what I want you to do is I want you to um, 
you know, then take one of the shuffle those up even more, okay. each little each, pile. Okay. So keep the uh-huh. reds together and the blacks together. You give them okay. a little bit of mix up, okay. and then hold the the two piles in your hands, one with black and one with red, and then face up or down, face up okay. because you're going to need to see them for this part. Oh, okay. So now it doesn't matter whether you start with a red or black. It's okay. up to you. But I want you to alternate hands right. and putting down black, red, black, black red, or red, black, black red, okay. black until you've worked through your whole stack. Okay. Doing it. Doing it. Doing it. And for those of you who didn't have time to get the cards at home, you can go back online and listen to this later and Correct. try it for yourself as good, well. Good segue. Okay. So you're going to now uh, tie, you're going to take that and turn the entire pile face down. All right. And then you're going to cut and complete the cut, which means you take a portion of cards off and put them under the other cards. Got and you. do this again. Okay. And then do it one more time. You can do it uh, as many times as you'd like. Okay. But for the purposes of doing this on the radio, let's Got just you. stop there. Got you. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to take the top two cards two, okay. and turn those face up on top of the deck. Okay. So you're just flipping it over sideways so they're on the top of the deck. Okay. Now cut and complete the cut. Ooh. This will mean some of the cards are face up and some of the cards are face down. Got you. Now I want you to do the same thing again. Two cards on top, turn them face up on top of the deck, okay. and then cut and complete the cut. Okay. And then I'm going to have you do this again. Turn the top two cards. Now in this instance, I got a card that's face up and face down, yeah. but it doesn't matter. Okay. Take the top two cards, whatever they are, and turn them over okay. on top of the deck Cut and complete the cut. Got you. Now, uh, this time, um, I'll let you choose. You can do two cards or four cards or six cards. Just take that amount of cards, yeah. uh, whatever it is, and turn those over on top of the right, deck. I'm going to see. I'm doing four. Great. Okay. And then cut and complete the cut. Okay. Now, at this point, you should have a bunch of different cards in your hand. If you spread the cards up, you'll see you have a number of different cards face up. I, I have, for example, six cards. How many do you have face I up? I have four. You six. have four. And have you six. have six? Have oh, six. okay, Andrew. How many in the booth? Just hold your fingers up is fine. Uh, he's got six, too. Oh, that's right. kind of interesting. Right. Well, that doesn't always happen. You at home may have had a different experience. Okay. Uh, now, this is the important part. If your birthday is January 1st through uh, June 30th, then I want you to turn the top two cards over. If your really? birthday is July 1st through December 31st, I don't want you to do anything. Okay. Okay? I turn two. You got that? Yes. All right. Now, uh, how many face-up do you have? I have eight uh, face-up. How many do you have? Four. Six still. You have six. Andrew has uh, eight. Okay, great. Okay. So a bunch of people might have them all over the place, and okay. that's fine. Now, uh, without turning the cards over, mm-hmm. I want you to deal them uh, one at a time into two piles, alternating. So just left, right, okay. left, right, left, right, etc., until you exhaust your pile. And then at this uh, point, yeah. I'm going to give you the choice. Okay. Uh, you can pick up either of the piles off the table. Just pick up one. Got it. Turn it over. And put it on top of the cards that are on the table. Okay. And that's it. Now, you notice that's we all trick. had an opportunity. No, that's <laughs> that's not the trick. That is the process of chaos. Okay. What we've done is we've given everybody an opportunity to kind of uh, have their own personal interpretation of how to do this, turning over however many cards, shuffling the cards, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Now, the magic happens. Okay. Literally. Say it with me. Magic. Ma- with you. <laughs> okay. With you is fine, too. Ma- magic. But magic. No, I That's can't. it. That's it. Magic. Okay. How many letters are there in the word magic? Five. Five. Great. If you spread the cards out right now, you'll notice to count down the uh, face down cards on the table. How many do you have? One, two, three, four, five. Five. Andrew, how many do you have? Five. That's amazing. But it gets weirder still. Okay. Because all the cards in your, that are in your hand that are face up are all the same color. What? They are. And look at all the cards that are now face down. You'll see all of those cards. What? And that, my friend, is the magic. That is the magic. We shuffled them like 55 times. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and you turn them over and you cut wherever you wanted to. You had complete control That's over incredible. this process. That's incredible. And yet, almost everybody that does this will experience this simultaneously. And the fact that you don't have to be here with us, you can listen to this on the radio and try it again and again and again, and it will end up being magic those five cards and the colors separating Dude, which again wrong. it's astounding it's amazing i did this for myself the first time um and when at the end i was like wait i have five cards okay that's cool that's but wait 
the colors are, are have separated themselves. How the heck does this happen? Yeah. It, I have no idea. I just know that this is one of those moments as an example of kind of how your brain Wait, ships. Wait, did you just say you have no brain. idea how that happens? I, I honestly, I still don't fully understand why it works. I just know that it does. And that's what's cool about it. Again, you and I and Andrew and, and your listeners can all do wow. this at home and experience a different type of experience. Now, maybe we'll get a chance to do one Thanks. more piece of kind of visceral magic at home but uh, here in the studio. But what's cool about this, this is just one example of how magic happens in between your ears. It happens in your mind. A magician goes to establish a certain expectation or leads yeah. the audiences down a certain way of thinking to the point where they establish their own expectation and then... And at some point, when the magic happens, when the world shifts, and all of a sudden you realize things aren't what you expect them to be, you get that really cool That happened moment. when I became an adult. <laughs> well, there, sometimes that can be a good experience, and sometimes it's not so good. But Tell me about, so is this a sample of something people would see tonight at... Kimball Jenkins. Uh, this will not be at Kimball Jenkins, although maybe I will. I don't know. Um, over my years of doing Discovering Magic, I took great pride every month in having a different show every month. Yes. And that was great for the first three years, but it was exhausting because you're having to learn a new 90-minute show every month. Um, and you're a one-man show. You're not uh, relying. You, you did a full turnover of all the... Uh, almost a complete did. turnover. Oh, and I would exhausting. print a yeah, whole yeah, yeah. program and I would do uh, that. And then over time, I did about half the show and then a quarter of the show and... And slowly the show kind of solidified into one area. But I always kept one element of chaos in my show. And there will be tonight, if you come to our show at the Kimball Jenkins, you can buy your tickets at hatboxnh.com. Um, you will experience the mystery box. And the mystery box is my opportunity because I know what's in it, but I don't know what's going to be selected. And so it's the opportunity for the audience to kind of dictate what's happening. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, and we do that a lot in the show. I have a lot of interactive type of moments where people uh, participate in the show similar to this, yep, yep. Uh, and they get to experience magic uh, either directly, uh, physically themselves, and uh, maybe in our last sequence we'll have time to do one of those, but also uh, that they have uh, viscerally through an extension of themselves. If somebody signs a playing card or whatnot. You mentioned the card and the glass. When I yeah. performed at Newick's uh, seafood restaurant. I did that for 11 years. And the bar show I did there on the ceiling when they closed the venue, because uh, Newick's closed that space. It's now a medical center or something. I did a, a trick where a signed card ended up stuck on the ceiling. And it was a very popular uh, piece that I did there. And by the time I ended, the staff, I was there till the day before they closed. And as they were closing up the venue, some of the staff decided to get a ladder out and take down all of the cards. And they counted them. There were over 700 playing cards. What is yeah? Oh my God! So it's an opportunity to extend that magic moment that people can come in and go, "Look, Martha, my card's up on the ceiling." Wow, kind of a thing. And you so mean they stayed up there. Yeah, yeah, they stayed up there for eleven years. Yeah, it was. That's a piece I used to do uh, a lot. Um, in fact, there may still well be. If you go to the Mountain Club at Loon in Lincoln, New Hampshire, um, there is vaulted ceilings. And once I threw a deck of cards up about thirty-five feet, hit a hit a post that was up there or a beam, yeah. and the card stuck to the ceiling. It was there for years and years afterwards. Now they would call it littering, but you know, dude, you are my hero. I'm telling you, a candy-colored clown. They call the Sandman. That's what's happening here. You are listening to NH Unscripted. I am your Roy Orbison-like host, Ray Dudley. Yep, I'm the one with the bunny slippers. Andrew Pernod is in the house just giving me chills. You are listening to us either on 1450 AM or 103.9 FM on your Sony Walkmans, baby. That's Concord 101.9 FM in Manchester. And NHTalkRadio.com is the URL. Andrew and I got some more to talk about. We'll be right back. Woo! NH Unscripted is on fire today. Andrew Pennard is in the house. He's doing magic, magic on the radio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he ain't heavy. He's my brother. You know that. 
14.50 a.m. 103.9 FM for you lucky people in Concord. 101.9 FM in Manchester. I am your Holly's Like host, Reed Dudley, and I'm wearing the bunny slippers today. NHTalkRadio.com is our URL where you can go out there. There's a listen live button. This show, every Wednesday and Friday morning, 9 a.m., you can hear us. Or let's say you're lonely. You wake up in the middle of the night. You know, I got an itch for Ray. Why am I going to hear Ray? Well, you can go out to nhtalkradio.com, and there's uh, all the archives are out there. Yes, yes, we'll be like friends in the middle of the night. All the archives of this show, plus all the other great programs that take place here, are out at nhtalkradio.com. Mr. Pennard. Where, what's your calendar look like? Well, I'm I'm pretty busy, and I have a number. Aren't of, we all? I have a number of different types of shows that I do. In addition to discovering magic, I also do a family show, Alejandro's Old Time Magic Show, which is the show I've been doing the longest. It's kind of a vaudeville style magic show for ages four to one hundred and four. Uh, and then I do my nineteenth century conjuring act, Jonathan Harrington, nineteenth century Wait, magician. What? So I have a variety of shows that I get to do. The nineteenth century act I actually perform in costume and character, and and in a minute I'm going to do a piece from the Harrington show for you. But I've got discovering magic. Magic coming up at the Kimball Jenkins Estate, uh, June 12th, July 10th, and August 14th. I will be performing once again at the uh, New Hampshire Magazine's Best of New Hampshire Party. I've been very fortunate to uh, be recognized by New Hampshire Magazine six times uh, as magical entertainment here in the state. Uh, that's going to be on June 20th at uh, in Lee, New Hampshire. Go to uh, New Hampshire Magazine's website to find tickets. I also have performances. But can anyone go? Just anyone can go? Yeah, you can buy a ticket. What's cool about the Best of Party is that that it features a lot of the people who have been featured in the magazine. And so they have entertainment, they have food, they have activities, they have lots of things going on. So I think it's at a, um, it's at a, a last year it moved from its previous location and was held at a, a winery uh, out in yes. Lee. And it's going to be back there this year, and I'm very excited to be back with them. So that's on June 20th. And then I'm doing my old-time magic show. I'm doing it in Sandport in New Hampshire on June 25th in the morning at 10 a.m. And then I have two shows for the Plymouth Parks and Recreation program at 2 p.m. and 5 p.m. on that day. So I'm doing three shows of that just on that day alone. Um, I've got a corporate event that I'm doing up in Hanover June 28th. Uh, I'll be at the Grantham Old Home Day on June 29th. Uh, And so, you know, that's just June. So it's... uh, It's been good. You it's were been not good. lying when you said you were busy. Well, it's fun to explore different types of magic and different types of audiences and the expectations. Um, I just did a residency at the Players Ring back in February doing my 19th century act. I actually had presented it for many, many years at Canterbury Shaker Village uh, and always enjoyed doing it. And I want to do a piece from that show now. The cool thing about the Harrington show is that I perform in costume and character with language of the time. I'm not going to go so far as that because they can't see the costume here on the air. But I have here a little. I'll wooden, say it looks good. I have a little wooden box right here, and in the box I have a couple of coins. They're coins from the era. Yes. I'm going to tip them into your hand. Got it. Okay. Yep. And if you take a look at them, you can read the dates out loud. Maybe oh, you can read the dates. Maybe I can. 1827. Let's say 18, 1852. 1852 and 1827. Uh, Jonathan Harrington gave his first uh, public paid performance in 1826, and in 1852 is when he was featured in a magazine. So I'm going to give you an option. Do you want to use the – there are two different colors. One's silver and one's copper. Mm. The 1827 coin is silver, and the 1852 coin is copper. Which would you like? Silver. Silver. Okay. Uh, you hold on to that. We're going to put you. the copper coin back in the box. You okay. can hear it. You I can do. see it. I, I close it up. You can still hear it in the box. I okay? do. We're going to set that down over here right. now i have a handkerchief whoops sorry about that when you're doing theater it makes it a little harder <laughs> and i'm going to take your silver coin and okay. i'm going to place it inside the handkerchief all it's, right it's hidden under the handkerchief okay. if you listen you can hear me tap it yes if you feel it you can feel it yes okay now i want you to hold your hand just like i'm holding it right above my hand okay okay perfect yep. and just hold that right there next Got to the it. microphone so you have okay. one coin I, do. I have one coin you can hear okay. my coin here I can. you know you have your other one here on the count of three one two three i'm still shaking the box he is there's no noise if i open the box what do you see ray nothing it's nothing empty. if you hold the what? handkerchief near the microphone and shake you've you- got to be kidding me Seriously? Can I open it? You can open it. Look inside the uh, handkerchief. You'll see... Son of a gun! Read the dates on the coins. Read the dates. 1827. Right? 
Yep, in 1852. There you go. The copper coin has transported itself through space and Dude, time to join the silver. If you drop them back in the box, I'll take the handkerchief box, and then Man. we would bow to the applause. Thank you. So that's an example of a visceral type of experience, and that's something that that's your audience didn't need to see. They could actually hear. I don't know if you pan the microphones, so if left they heard one and right they heard Oh, the yeah, other. they would. I'm, I'm sure. sure the technique here is all, all well, We're cutting way. edge. We're definitely cutting uh, edge. But th- th- that is a piece that Harrington would might have performed. There was a piece in his show called Money on the Wing, and the Harrington show is a show that I've been doing for over a decade. Um, it's research. Jonathan Harrington was an actual person. He was born in Boston in 1811, and died in 1881 in what is now Revere. It was North Chelsea at the time. In fact, he was instrumental in getting the city of Revere named Revere uh, because he was one of the local well-known personalities. In fact, for many years, he organized the children's entertainment on Boston Common for the 4th of July events. So Harrington's a really remarkable uh, character in magic history. He's a much lesser known character. Um, But I came about doing Harrington because a friend of mine performed as Richard Potter. Now, Richard Potter was the first American-born magician of note. He was the first professional that really hit the big time. Uh, And he retired to New Hampshire in Andover at Potter Place. Richard Potter was his name. Mm. And a friend of mine, Robert Olson, actually uh, has been performing as Richard Potter for over 50 years. Really? And at one point, he asked me to take over his act when he retires. And I suggested I would be really interested in doing that. But to perform in costume and character, I wanted to hit the ground running, so I wanted to rehearse it. And so I came across this character, Jonathan Harrington, who had actually was a real person who had seen Richard Potter and had ties to Richard Potter. In fact, one of his earliest broadsides was a copy of Richard Potter's, um, you know, posters kind of a thing. And uh, they say, you know, um, uh, what do they say? Uh, You know, imitation is the sincerest form of theft, uh, flattery. (laughs) Um, But that's the way things worked back then. People were borrowing uh, what worked for other performers and performing it themselves. And then over time you define yourself as a character and a personality and and so it's really exciting for me because the Harrington show not only pertain you know has magic that most people would see like what I just did for you almost nobody gets to see it unless you come and see the Harrington show because it's a piece that oh. is not done very frequently and yet for a piece that's almost 200 years old you know the argument is is that wow it's just as strong today as it was 200 years ago why do you stop doing things like that it's because things travel in you know fashion people do different types of acts so for me the Harrington show is a lot of fun to do because people are transported to a different time Mm -hmm. you know they really get to experience something in a different way and they pay attention because they have to the language is different the setting is conducive to kind of wrapping the audience and the performer in an enchantment literally of a performance I mean at the the ring and at Canterbury Shaker Village performing in a historic setting I tried to make the lights represent and look more like gaslight or candlelight in the spaces so you had flickering lights you had dimmer situations than you would normally have you know in today's LED lighting and things of that nature but breathing and focusing on process and focusing on the audiences uh, being in the moment you know there is nothing that gets audiences more into the moment than a performance of magic because they don't know what's going to happen they know that they're invested and personally engaged in it and when it changes whenever that transformation or whenever that magical effect occurs it's profound Mm. to people and they take it, they need time to kind of respond to it. I mean, I feel guilty performing this magic thing for yeah. you, Why? you know, without giving you time to kind of go, oh God, what crazy. the heck? How did uh, so and what the heck anyway? <laughs> what else could be possible? I mean, ultimately, that's what I try to do. A lot of people think magic is about the impossible. I really believe that magic is about what might be possible if you can only put yourself into the headspace and put the energy and effort that's required to making it happen. Are you a believer that sim- simpler is better? Oh, definitely. Yeah? Yeah, I think the, the, the simple lets audiences focus uh, on the things that matter. 
Um, I have been uh, in another life. I was also a book designer. I've done a lot of work uh, in the magic industry and also in the um, kind of the institutional, the educational market, designing books. And when you design a book, it's all about enhancing the experience for the reader. And if you're doing a technical book, something that has figures that you have to follow, so somebody's trying to learn something, right. you know, there is uh, there uh, you're you're building on years and years of work to uh, make things happen in a simple way. And Mark Twain, I think, said it best. Uh, When he wrote a long letter to a friend, he apologized, saying, I'm sorry for the length of this letter. I wish I could have had it be shorter. I ran out of time. (laughs) Brother, speaking of time, give us the dates. So we have June uh, June 12th tonight, July 10th, and August 14th, Discovering Magic at the Kimball Jenkins Estate. You can go to hatboxnh.com and get your tickets there. And you can also find out information about me by going to absomagic.com. That's A-B-S-O-M-A-G-I-C.com. Or as some people like to say, abs Oh, magic Brother, Andrew Bernard was in the house today doing magic. And you have been listening to NH Unscripted, where we are doing the Neutron Dance. 14.50 AM, 103.9 FM in Concord, 101.9 FM for the beautiful people in Manchester. NHTalkRadio.com is our URL. I am your pointer sisters like host, Ray Dudley. I'm going to catch you on the next one.